We'll, uh, I think we're ready. Let's see what our first trivia question is today. It comes from the scriptures. Name the first five books of the Bible. What are they, Brenda? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. There you go. I need to make an adjustment here. The, the orange and the red tab. Pull them all the way down. Yeah, both of them. There you go. Okay, that helps. All right, so Brenda, you got that one right. So good job. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Next question. Which of the following is not a book of the Bible? Not from the Bible, of the Bible. Nahum, Haggai, Enoch, or Zephaniah? Enoch. Well, we got books, Everybody say, is that a consensus? Enoch is not in the Bible? Yeah. That's the right. Look at there, we got two for two. What book of the Bible comes immediately after the four Gospels? Linda's good back there. Everybody agree with that? Acts. That's the Bible study. <laughs> Let's see if that's right. It is Acts. We're gonna we're gonna catch you in a minute. What is the name of the city in which Jesus grew up? It's not Bethlehem. Nazareth. Nazareth. Anne had it first. But I was trying to see if anybody else knew. <laughs> oh, we all had it first. Okay. So we're going to get to tradition now. Let's see if there's any traditional stuff we know. How many sacraments does the United Methodist Church recognize? And what are they? How many first? Let's get to the number. Community of baptism, that's the number, that's the answer, but okay, that's two. <laughs> that's the answer. Baptism and communion. Or what did we learn to call communion last week? Eucharist. Eucharist. Okay. The person that started the Protestant Reformation by writing the 95 Theses on the power and efficiency of indulgences. Martin Luther. Martin Luther. Well, y'all did really good today. In 1054, the church split into two separate churches, one in the east and one in the west. Name the two churches. Ten fifty four. Some of y'all were there, right? <laughs> I wasn't born until fifty six. <laughs> oh, you weren't born until fifty six. Okay. It's the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. When this man invented mechanical, movable type for the printing press in the 1400s, the first book he published was the Bible. Luther. Linda's got it in the back. Yeah. You know his first name? See, we're going to learn something anyway. Johannes, Johannes Gutenberg. A lot of interesting stories about that. Uh, let's see what's next, Johnny. What is the number? Now, this is about, and those were tradition, tr scripture and tradition. This is reason. What's the next number in the sequence when you have a one, then a one, a two, and a three, a five, and eight, and a 13? I don't know the answer, but we'll find out in a minute. But I'm not here. What, I heard one guess of 10. What did you say, Faye? 21 is what you're saying? Four. Four. We got an answer of four. Four, 21. Any other numbers? 21. 21. We got another 21. We got, two we got huh, what was that? 14, somebody say? Okay, let's see what it is. It's 21. Raise your hand if you got it right. Okay, now we know who to go to for math. Before Mount Everest was discovered, what was the world's tallest mountain? But it was still Mount Everest. That's right. It was still Mount Everest. It just hadn't been discovered yet. 
Yeah, uh, but that's because you were there too. Uh, okay. and, and you know, when we get to experience, one of the things that Wesley brought to to the church was the notion of experience. That it was one thing to know the scriptures, it was another thing to understand the traditions, it was another thing to think about it, but it's how we experience it. And we're going to talk more about that when we get into the scriptures later today. But what the the lesson today said: the last shall be first. In other words, if you're only concerned with being first in line, you're never going to experience the greatness of the kingdom. Because sometimes the view's better from the back. All right, that's enough trivia for today. I think we've survived it. Y'all did well. This is the best you've done. I'll see if I can find harder questions next week. Um, so as you're able, would you stand as we sing together? Come now, Almighty King. just great stories in there. Elijah uh, is apparently kind of chunky and uh, apparently bald. And if you haven't read this story in a while, it's right in 2 Kings where he uh, is walking along and some boys made fun of him for being fat and bald. And so he called the, the uh, bears out of the woods to eat the boys. And somebody said, that's not really in the Bible. It is. It's, it's really there. But today he's telling a different story than that Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man and in high favor with his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. This man, though a mighty warrior, suffered from leprosy. Now the Arameans, on one of their raids, had taken a young girl captive from the land of Israel and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my Lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his Lord just what the girl from the land of Israel had said, and the king of Aram said, Go then, and I will send along a letter to the king of Israel. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to give death or life that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Just look and see how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come to me, that he may learn that there's a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and halted at the entrance of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a message to him, saying, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored 
and you shall be clean. But Naaman became angry and went away saying, I thought that for me, he would surely come out and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and would wave his hand over the spot and cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and far far the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? He turned and went away in a rage. But his servants approached and said to him, Father, if the prophet had commanded you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? How much more when all is said to you was wash and be clean? So he went down and immersed himself seven times in the Jordan. And according to the word of the man of God, his flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Then he returned to the man of God, and all his company, he came and stood before him and said, Now I know there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Friends, as you're able, would you stand as we affirm our faith this morning with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence it shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. As we prepare to pray together this morning, AJ is going to lead us. He leadeth me, O blessed dog. If you want to come forward and pray, you're always welcome. Thank you.
Well, you know, so often we get together to pray and we pray for all of the stuff that's going on in the world, for people to get along better. But today we're going to have a prayer of praise and rejoicing because Carol has a new grandbaby. Uh, let's see if I can get this right. Born on September, uh, September 30th and was seven pounds and some ounces and whose name is Miles something. Anyway, pretty close. That's the best I can do without notes. And so uh, we want to, we always are happy to have the new grandbabies. The, the story for the rest of y'all is that she got to stay home and keep a three-year-old for a few days. So she's happy to be back in church today. <laughs> uh, you also will see around and I'll be giving, there's some more of them available. There's a sheet that looks like this. Uh, this has every time slot between now and the 22nd of October on it for the pumpkin patch. Uh, the pumpkins, we got 514 big pumpkins this year, which was about 300 less than last year. Uh, there was a drought, you may have heard about it, and they parsed them out best they could. Unfortunately, we did not get the, the tiny pumpkins that we usually buy and then hand out to the kids at the school. Uh, so we're going to do something. We're not exactly sure what, but you will be told as soon as we know. Uh, to give them their sticker and tell them if they come back with mom and dad, we'll give them a little bit of a discount because we didn't get to. And actually, that might work out better for us, maybe get more of them to come back. But uh, anyway, we, we're we sad about it, but we're going to still do some fun stuff. So we have kids coming Wednesday morning at 930, at 10, at 1030, and 11. And then we have kids starting again, I believe, at 1230 and 1. I'm pretty close anyway, around those times, and all the way to about 230. So Wednesday and Thursday that we're going to get all of the 400 kids from Golden Echoes Elementary to come. Uh, it is great to have as many people as we can have hanging out here with us when we do that. Uh, we'll be telling them some stories and probably playing some games. Uh, but we've, we've asked them to bring the kids for 30 minutes. Uh, so because in the past we can occupy them for about 25 minutes. And then we had a, a madhouse of kids running around and so we asked them to restrict it so we can uh, better manage our time as well. So uh, anyway, if you've never seen it, it's a hoot to see 40 kids running around Pumpkin Patch. Uh, we'll be telling them some stories and uh, playing some games with them and describing pumpkins that come in all kinds of sizes and shapes. We have not had them here now in three years. This is, well, two years. Maybe three. I don't know. COVID started in 19, right? So we didn't have them then. In 20. Didn't have them for three years. Yeah, we haven't had them for three years. And so most of the kids come in, in the years past, they came every year. So the kids will say, oh yeah, I was here last year. Most of these kids coming will not have been here. So it'll be fun. And we're looking forward to doing that. Uh, another report for you is that uh, our friend and brother Chester Goodwin got out of the hospital on Friday. Uh, he is recovering at home from his hospital time, but we'll be doing some outpatient chemotherapy as he continues his treatment. Uh, I talked to Sue Garman this week, and she's doing well. She's just uh, having struggles early in the mornings getting out to get places. So uh, we hope to see her soon. If you don't have her number, you want to call her and say hi. Check with me, and I'll give it to you. Let's pray. Gracious God, we, we come to church in some ways to get away from all the stuff that's going on in the world. We come here to rejoice, to have praises for the ways prayers are answered. And of course, we come here to pray together for the things that you would have be done in this kingdom, the things in our community that break your heart. And God, we flounder and struggle about the best ways to serve you sometimes looking for a sign to know what would be the best thing, and yet we know that just to push forward, following Jesus Christ, loving our neighbor, and caring for others is the only thing you really ask us to do. But you know, God, like Naaman, sometimes we want pomp and circumstance. We want it to be a big deal. And some of the most useful things we do in the kingdom are not big deals at all. Maybe it's providing food for a homeless person out in our family, our food box. Or maybe it's allowing someone that doesn't have any money or time to come into the pumpkin patch and take pictures with their family. Maybe it's just showing love in places that others can't see the need. 
So today we think back about the stories we've heard about the disciples, how they too struggled. How they wanted to increase their faith, how they wanted to know better things. And even when they asked Jesus, how do we pray? And his answer was pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we sing together wonderful words of life, if you're able, would you stand as we sing it and then remain standing for the reading of the gospel? say the thing thing is the screen and the screen's right but uh, hey I'm the preacher so we'll do it my way. <laughs> Amen. Uh, one of the things that we're aware of this year is that uh, life goes on even for the church and so this is not anything special except to tell you that our, <laughs> our insurance for the church this year went up to twenty, almost $24,000 a year so we keep continuing to get unexpected expenses because uh, the world around us is going up and changing. So anyway, in a few seconds, I'll be inviting the ushers to come forward for the collection of our gifts, tithes, and offerings. And uh, just want you to know that we are so grateful that people participate and help us to be the church in this community and throughout the world as we uh, learn to do new things in new ways. We'll be talking about that more as I get into the message in a little while. Uh, let, at this time, I invite the ushers to come forward for the collection of our gifts, tithes, and offerings. Let us pray. No. Gracious God, we thank you for the great gifts that you've given us in our lives, our families, our friends, and our church. But you know, like all other gifts, we also need to be a part of the solution. So 
Today we accept the opportunity to give our gifts, tithes, and offerings to further your kingdom in this community, to do more for others, to reach out and be the church for those people that are hurting so badly. God, we pray all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Anne. Beautiful. Let's stand. standing as I read the gospel. Sorry about that confusion. It was all on me. People working the sound always think, well, it makes it look like it's all on us, but it's not. I read from the gospel of Luke in the 17th chapter. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him Keeping their distance, they called out and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was being healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made to be clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return, give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And you may be seated. I want to read this again. I want to emphasize some particular words. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. And then Jesus asked, were not ten made be clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Jesus sees the lepers. When he sees the lepers, he recognizes a need. One leper sees that he's been healed. There's a blessing from seeing, isn't there? 
So many times when we think about what it means, Jesus says, remember, he says this, for those who have eyes to see, let them see. For those who have ears to hear, let them hear. One of the things that we have to start off is by seeing what's going on. One of the struggles we have in the church today is seeing what God needs us to be for the community. Not what we want to be. Not what's convenient. But sometimes it's hard to see. Jesus looks up and he sees ten lepers. He does not know that one's a Samaritan. And you could say, well, nine of them are ungrateful. Maybe not, because in that tradition, they're not really clean until the priest says they're clean. So the Jews have to go to the priest and be declared clean before they're clean. The Samaritan, that's not his faith. He doesn't have to worry about it. And so he sees that he's already been cleansed. And he goes back to thank Jesus because he had been seen. Jesus sees a need and he takes action. One sees that he's been healed and he gives thanks. I don't know. Sometimes I read this passage and I think, well, what is it, God, that you want us to see? What are we supposed to be seeing as God's children? And you know, I've been a part of different churches now for a long time, 70 years. And sometimes the memories I have are very unpleasant. I remember being in the back of the room when my dad was the chairman of a board at a Methodist church. This is before we became United Methodists. Discussion was had in the board. What would we do if a person from another race came into our church? And the consensus of many on the board was we would shut the doors, close the Bible, and go home. You mean a church would do that? Yeah. That was probably 65 years ago. Things have changed. Have they? We look around us and we see a lot of changes in our community, and I'm not even talking about that. What I'm talking about now is the changes that the church needs to make, because I've said this before, and I'll say it again. You can say, well, things aren't the same as they were before COVID. No, they're not. But they were already in decline. Bishop Jones, Bishop Huey, Bishop Norris have all identified that our churches in the Texas Conference are well prepared to do ministry if the 50s ever come back. They're not. So what do we see? What is the need? How can we do what Jesus did? How can we look out and see a need and then take action to respond to it? What do we do? And you know, the, dish, the definition of insanity written by some genius somewhere or someday said, if you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to keep getting what you always got. So, the way I understand that is God is moving in the church and God is using the church to move into the community in new and different ways and we haven't yet been able to determine what they are. And we won't get it right every time. I don't know if any of y'all play that silly Wordle game on the internet. I play it most days when I can remember. Uh, my friend JT texted me this morning and he said, how does that work? Yeah, you have five letters. You have to guess what the word is. And if you, every time you guess, if it's right, it's green. If it's right in the right place, it's green. If it's not right, it's yellow. I mean, if it's right and not in the right place, it's yellow. And if it's not right at all, it's gray. And then you keep using the alphabet until you figure out the word. And you can do it up to seven tries, I think it is. And if you fail, you fail. And so usually I get it four or five. And so JT texted me this morning. He said, I don't really understand that, how that works. And I said, well, it's really easy, JT. It's, difficult. it's not difficult at all unless it's really difficult. 
That's really profound. Y'all could go, aha, uh -huh, that makes sense. Uh -huh. Yeah. He said, in other words, it's a whole lot like life, isn't it? Sometimes life is extremely easy. Especially for three-year-olds, right, Carol? Sometimes life is just difficult. And sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes we just do the wrong thing. And that's the great thing about God is that God says, okay, so you made a mistake. You didn't do it right. I forgive you. Let's try another way. Let's get out and do something new for the kingdom. Whatever that new thing is. We've got a lot of stuff happening in the next two, three months here. We, you know, we got the pumpkin patch. We're going to figure out how to make that work. And, and it'll be what it is. We didn't get as many pumpkins as before. I can't do anything about that. So you know what? It's kind of that place where it's a little more difficult than we thought it was going to be. But we'll figure it out. And then in December, we're going to, or later in November, in December, we're going to collect gifts for Angel Tree Kids. And, and, you know, that'll be an experience and it'll be fun. And those are things we've been doing and they're good and we need to keep doing them. And then when it gets to be throughout land, we'll collect shoes and backpacks and belts for, uh, for CPS kids. But I'm not sure that that's all God's calling us to do. Somehow or another, I think God is saying, look, if you had eyes to see, you could see what's hurting in the neighborhood. If, if you just had eyes to see, you could see the things that need to be done. Now, I don't know about you, uh, until I got my uh, bionic eyes, I had to go back to the eye doctor every year to get a new prescription, some new glasses, you know. I still have to go back now, every now and then, to let them look at it and, and make sure that everything's in the right place and doing the right thing. So I don't get away from those checkups but the whole point is my vision and your vision needs to be corrected. And what I'm talking about here is the seeing vision given to us by Jesus Christ that allows us to see. And I'm going to tell you, friends, if we don't come and study the scriptures, if we don't pray, if we don't listen to what Jesus is saying to us, our vision will remain blinded to the things that need to be done around us. We need corrected vision. I need corrected vision. It's so much easier to just do what you've always done. I don't really know the answers to the future. And I, I do know that God's calling us. And I know that there's a lot of changes going on in our and other denominations. And things are looking glum for some and happy for others. But I think the thing that I want to know... <coughs> Is, you know, what do we really see? And when we see it, what do we do about it? Now, you know, for years, we've offered things like Alcoholics Anonymous and Al Anon, and those things here at our church. Uh, they have had boom times and they've had slow times. You know, we've done all kinds of different vacation Bible schools. Some years ago, we decided to do Pumpkin Badge instead. You know, who knows? Maybe 2023 will show different things for that. But I do know that, that there's a whole lot of people, a lot of people, that are members of United Methodist churches that for whatever reason, and I'm not going to go into all of that right now, are deciding they don't want to be United Methodists anymore that are being left out. I don't care if it's a 50 to 50 vote or 70 to 30. That means 30 people are left out. And those people need a place to go and they need to know that they're welcome. And so one of the things we need to do is let people know we're alive well and we're staying United Methodists. Amen. And maybe that's what we can see right now. I can see that right in front of me. I've been in, I'm on the district leadership team. I've been meetings with the district superintendent. I can tell you we're greatly worried about those people that are not being included. We're going to have an event in December. When it gets closer, I'll tell you about it. Where all of us that are staying at United Methodist can get together and have a party. And anybody who wants to come can come. And there's going to be food and all kind of stuff. It'll be great. What worries me is when we start to pick and choose who we pick and choose. Now, i got to tell you, I read that scripture from about Naaman. 
And I see so much of myself and other people in that. We think when God is going to respond to us in our life, it ought to be magnificent, right? I mean, there ought to be an aha moment. Boy, I remember the day. And, and, and certainly there are those times. But you know, the reality is the way God's going to sneak into your life is the same way Jesus snuck, snuck into the world, being a, a poor son of a poor carpenter that had no status. And it's not going to be the people that are standing up in front of you wearing a robe and a stole and acting like they know what they're talking about that leads you to Christ. It's going to be that person in your life that lives this story. Now, I hope I can lead you there. <clears throat> but all the surveys say it's hardly ever the preacher. That's kind of disconcerting, you know, when you go to seminary and you think, I'm, you feel this call of ministry, and I'm going to be able to just go out and save the world. No, but I might be able to lead somebody in the direction where Jesus can save them. And we need to remember that as we work through all of this stuff that's going on in our life. I read the story of Naaman and I, I think about what the servant says. If it was something hard, you'd have done it. And Jesus says, the simple thing is, friends, I didn't come to, to remove the law. I came to fulfill the law. Go out and love one another. Love others as I have loved you. Mm -hmm. Now, I always have to clarify that because, uh, you know, we have this kind of distorted view of love. You know, love is your significant other, your children, those kind of things. But... I'm not really talking about that kind of love. What I'm talking about here is that, that kind of love that you give for people, even if you don't like who they are, even if you don't like their lifestyle, even if you don't like the way they look, act, or believe, that we still are supposed to love enough to care what's going on. And it's only when we do that with some success that they're going to find a way into the kingdom where we believe they need to be. But it's got to be their movement. We can invite, we can offer, we can introduce. But Jesus does the same. Amen? Amen. Jesus is the one that changes lives. As much as I'd like to think I could change somebody's life, I can't even successfully change my own. But I'm kind of like Naaman, you know. Sometimes I think I'm a big shot. Yeah, right. In the United Methodist Church, get appointed to a suburb church, and you find out real quick that you're not a big shot. I mean, there's a church on every corner, Pasadena, Deer Park, Laporte. I'm just another one out of many. But our church has a heart. And this church has had a heart to see what was going on in the community. We saw the need four or five years ago to help CPS kids. Why? Because they moved from one house to the other to the other with their clothes in a trash sack. That's why. We saw a need to help Bill Nash and his people take CPS kids and make them champions. We didn't really understand it until some of us made a tour out there and we got to find out how he takes kids that have horrible, horrible, unthinkable circumstances and he looks them in the face and says, you're a champion. And he takes those same kids year after year until some of them now after 18 years are no longer homeless CPS kids, but they are now as counselors in this camp. Because you know what? It's so much more important to have a counselor that says, I know where you are, young lady, because I used to be there. <coughs> and of course... Uh, we've gotten through all of the, the negatives, I guess, around Angel Tree because we know, we loudly, clearly know that it's not some kid's fault that mom or dad are in prison. But we know the kids are kids. And what would, would Christmas be if there was never anything under the tree? It's a subtle message. I'm always reminded of Charles Colson when he started prison ministries only understood could only see the need back to seeing because he was actually in prison. When he was in prison, he saw the need for prison ministries. Some years ago, when uh, Chuck was still working for the sheriff's department, he's sitting back in the back, and, and, uh, and I got the opportunity to meet some of the chaplains and stuff, what I found out was that the state won't provide 
things like the Alcoholics Anonymous information or Holy Bibles and stuff for the people that are in prison. That has to be provided somebody else because we have to care enough to reach out to those people. We are strongly committed to a ministry called Kairos, which we do in prisons. I have friends going all the time to, to the different prisons to do Kairos ministry. We know that there's a need for people to be redeemed, and, and we believe that Jesus can do it. Amen. And sometimes, especially with Kairos, it used to be, it was so much more fun in the old days. We used to send out a note to everybody in the church and say, we need cookies. They have to be on two inches around. They could either be peanut butter cookies or something. Now they have to use all store-bought cookies. They've lost the ability to do homemade because of the world. But we took 100,000 cookies with us to, to the prison unit when I went. And we fed those inmates cookies till they couldn't eat another homemade cookie. Because that's what God's love looks like. It keeps coming at you even when you don't deserve it, when you don't ask for it, and it comes until you just finally get inundated with it, and maybe you turn around and realize God has been there all the time. Yep. Because God never left. And what makes me more sad than anything is I'm not saying that a lot of people in our world right now have left God. I don't think they got the first opportunity to be introduced to who God is because they've grown up over the last two or three generations of a very secular world that pays very little attention to God. I'm more and more aware that when I go out to restaurants and to other places, it's more and more important for me to be identified as a person that attempts to be righteous than it is for me to fit into the world and get in and out without being seen. I have to go into places where nobody wants to talk about God and exemplify God even if I don't talk about it. I think it was Thomas Aquinas that said, you need to preach all the time, once in a while, you need to use words. So, if, you know, if I were a pollster and I asked the question, does our world need to be changed? I reckon there'd be a yes answer from anybody? Yep. Yeah. If I were to ask a question, what do you see in the world that needs to be changed? Probably there'd be a very a variety of answers. And where the rubber meets the road is when I say, okay, now you've seen it, what are you going to do about it? And, you know, we can make all the standard cop-out answers. Well, I, you know, we're not a big church. I, I'm by myself. I don't really have any way to do it. I'm going to tell you, you're never alone when you go out to do what God wants you to do. God is with you. He will give you the words to say, the places to be, the things to do, and maybe even put you into those places where the opportunity arises. Some years ago, long time ago, many years ago, I was a brand new salesperson. I've been a policeman. Uh, you know, as a cop, you really don't have to be nice to people. <laughs> I, I mean, you just kind of show up and they know who you are and life goes on. So I went to work in this tractor dealership in Beaumont and I was the, it was the new salesman and and it was my job to greet people when they came in. And the walls were all glass so the boss could see what we were doing. And I'd sit there at my desk, you know, watching somebody come in the door. I'd kind of watch to see where they went. The boss came over there and he said, you know, I know probably it was before and your other career was different, but now you need to get up out of your chair and meet him at the door. I said, okay, I got that. And then, you know, people would come in and say, you know, I think I think I want to maybe trade tractors or bush hogs or something. Okay, well, here, I'll make a note of it. And I worked with a guy whose name is Donald, Donald Leger. And Donald and I worked side by side in there. And the difference was Donald was aggressive and I was shy. And I watched him one day, and a guy came in, and he said, you know, I'm thinking about maybe trading tractors. And Don said, well, you got one you want to trade? He said, yeah. He said, do you really? He said, yeah. He said, well, let's get in the car and go look at it right now. And that was Donald's modus operandi. Every time he was opportunistic, he never wasted an opportunity. If he was supposed to be somewhere at noon and it wasn't important and the guy wanted to buy something, Donald was going with him. And you know what I learned from that is that, that there are certain things we don't have a second chance at. 
How many of us have walked into Sears or Wards in the old days when the appliance place was there and we really needed a new fridge? And we walked by and the guy showed it to us. He was nice with, hey, yeah, I might buy one of those someday. And he said, well, are you interested in that? No. And, or, or just come back when you're ready would be their answer. And you know what? We never got ready. I wonder in my life how many people have come up to me wide open and ready to hear the salvation story. And I have put it off for another day. Or waited till it was more convenient. Or thought I'll get with them next time. I know I've told you the story, but uh, there's a guy that I know, and he's a Methodist preacher out in California. He bought him a new motorcycle. All Methodist preachers should buy a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And he rode that motorcycle around and he had a flat. And he called the dealer, and the dealer sent a truck driver out to pick up the motorcycle and him and take it to get a flat, a new tire. And on the way, he was thinking, you know, I don't know if this kid that's driving this truck knows Jesus. I don't know if he knows what the salvation story is. I, I don't know. Maybe I should talk to him about it. But he didn't. They got to the dealership, he got a new tire, he left, and a few days later, that young man was killed in a car wreck. And Marty's comment to himself was, I wonder if he knew the Lord. I had an opportunity to share the Lord with him, and I didn't do it. Now that guilt caused him to open up many other ministries that he does in his life. But I resonate with that. Not just with record drivers or truck drivers or cab drivers or whatever. I actually pushed through when Kathy and I were in, in uh, Eureka Springs. We had a, a cab pick us up and take us. We wanted to ride our motorcycles out there. It was pretty neat. It was a stretch limo. We felt really important. Probably kind of like Naaman in the story. And he dropped us right off at the front door and we went in and we watched the Passion play for two hours. We walked out and guess what? He's parked right there to pick us up. But this time we sat near the front. We didn't sit clear in the back. And we visited with him. He was a retired psycho, some kind of therapist from the military. He's driving the cab because he likes to talk to people. Lives in Eureka Springs. Has taken hundreds of people to see the Passion play, but he's never been. We talked a little bit about the Bible. He had some information. He wasn't clueless about God. Yeah, I actually said to him, you know what? You ought to go see it. It might make a difference in your life. He said, you know, they have a special night for those of us living in Eureka Springs. We could go cheaper. I said, well, I think you ought to go. And as we got to the hotel where he was dropping us off, I told him one more time, I said, really, man, I mean it. You need to go see the Passion Play. I said, I know the story. I know the scriptures. I've heard it a lot of times. But it's moving for me to understand what our Lord and Savior went through so I could have life today. And if you haven't experienced it that way, that's exactly what Wesley's talking about when I go back to that question uh, in, in the trivia thing about experience. If you haven't experienced that, then God will help you find it if you keep plunging through. Every time you come to church, it's going to be a mountaintop experience. Every sermon's not going to be great. Maybe hardly any are going to be great. That's not even the point. But as we begin to follow through and be faithful and follow our Lord and Savior and be a part of the ministry of God's church, then I believe, I still believe, I've said it now for 14 years here, I believe even if it's out of a small place like this in Pasadena, Harris County, Texas, USA, the world can be changed and maybe we can be the epicenter of that change. What do you see? And what are you willing to do to make it different? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
as we close our service today. This would uh, be a great time if you so desire to come and profess your faith. You can always join by transfer of membership. There are a gazillion ways you can do that. Or you can just come up and, and pray. We're glad to have you with us today as you are able to stand when you stand and let's sing the hymn of promise as we close our service. <clears throat> times if you haven't found one there's some laying up here and there's probably some in the back i invite you to look at that so we can try to figure out how not to get all of us here at the same time but spread it out to make it work friends it's been great bit to be with you today we got beautiful weather uh, we're going to open up the patch this afternoon at 2 30 to make some decorations and fix it up if you want to hang out with us you're welcome to do that i want you to know that god loves you god cares about you jesus is leading us the Holy Spirit will help us. So let's just go to it. Amen. 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 Amen.